Hello, everyone, and welcome to this community meetup. I am Ryan Mocky, a developer evangelist here in Mendix community team. Um, our regular host, uh, Jan de Vries, isn't currently here. He's on vacation in Italy. Um, so he's asked me to step in just for today. Um, so today I'm joined by Jeroen Apple and Leonard Sitzman, Sitzma, sorry, from Clever, and uh, John Higginbotham from EXP Realty. And they're going to be talking about data consistency at scale and how to achieve this at e how they achieve this at EXP Realty. So as always, you can ask your questions in the chat. Um, we will get to them at the end of the session if there's time. Um, that's all from me for now, but one last thing before I go, and that's if you haven't registered for Mendix World, make sure to do so. I'll put the link in the chat. That's all from me. So over to you, Jeroen. All right. So yeah, welcome everyone. So um, as uh, uh, thanks for the introduction, of course. That, I think that's a good thing. Uh, so I will just move a few things around here. So my name is uh, Jeroen Appel, and uh, and welcome to the first official Clever Mendex meetup. Um, so today we will dive into the complexity of distributed systems and discuss how we can keep your data consistent at scale. Um, so this session will be co-hosted with EXP Realty, and we are very happy that uh, John is able to join us today. Uh, we will come to the introductions uh, right away after the agenda. So again, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the Q&A section as well. Uh, and I expect them to answer them uh, at the very end of the session. So we have, uh, have had all three of them. Um, so as you can see here, our agenda, we are fully packed with uh, three sessions in a row. So after the introduction, uh, I will provide you a, a crash course. Um, so it's mainly on how to cope with exception handling in a multi-app landscape. Um, I expect it to be most interesting for junior and media consultants or concerned product owners. Uh, and afterwards, we will receive the main course with uh, John and Leonard, and they will explain how uh, XP Realty is using Apache Kafka to scale their microservice architecture. Uh, John will guide us through the uh, uh, company and the architecture itself, where uh, Leonard will teach us uh, how to implement Kafka in uh, your Mendex environment. So let's go to the uh, introductions uh, right away. Um, John, uh, I think it's awesome that you're able to join us today. I think that's a big plus for uh, online meetups uh, uh, instead of physical ones. Uh, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, my name is John Higginbotham. Um, I've been with EXP for about a year and a half. Um, and I've been a Mendix developer for about six years now. And uh, I actually joined EXP, I think, when I saw their uh, original, one of the original um, presentations that they did at, at Mendix World a couple of years ago about microservices. and. From there, I was interested and in joined the company after that. Oh, well, good story. Thanks. Uh, then I think uh, we can uh, give uh, the mic to uh, Leonard. There he is. Sure. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so uh, my name is Leonard. I've joined Clever about a year and a half ago. And that's also when I started with Mendix. And I've been with EXP for, I don't know, nine months. Or so. So yeah, that's me. Very well. And then uh, myself, I am uh, with Clever, uh, working as a Manix consultant as well for around five years now. Um, I'm also a machine learning enthusiast uh, and meetup leader at, uh, at Clever. Um, when I'm not working, you will probably see me uh, doing scouting work um, or brewing my own beer. Uh, and otherwise, I am uh, enjoying my time outside with uh, with my girlfriend and uh, doing stuff like that. So I think uh, it's uh, enough of us. And uh, let's dive into uh, the material itself. I will go to the next slide. So there it is. So the first session, um, we tried to create a meetup uh, where there's something to learn or at least refresh for all levels of Mendex makers, but also for decision makers. Uh, product owners, um, there should for, for everyone, there should be valuable insights. Uh, so first of all, the crash course with uh, about challenges with distributed systems, and that uh, will be me. 
So as, a, as a Mendix developer, I think we've all been there, uh, integrating with systems uh, to handle data or trigger actions. And of course, by using the Mendix platform, this, this has become easier than ever. Um, but nevertheless, it, it can be hard to cope with complex systems where the other party might become unavailable or unpredictable. Um, so in some scenarios, we are the ones who control either one or both of those parties. Um, so this will be like 15 minutes of your, of your lives, uh, hearing me complain about uh, how complex stuff has become and we all got to cry collectively. Um, no, that's, um, to be serious, I think uh, I will be, I pinpoint uh, some points of attention uh, related to distributed architectures uh, and provide some advices on how to handle exceptions in, uh, uh, in those scenarios. Uh, so hopefully this session will create awareness um, or as a mentor once told me, uh, trigger a wet socks feeling. And I'm not sure if that's a thing in English, but I think you get the, the point. So um, let's to try our best and keep this under 15 minutes. Let's say that there are three types of uh, main types of distributed systems. Uh, then we have first the uh, offline systems. Uh, then you can think about batch processing or data analysis. Mm -hmm. So there are fewer use cases, um, but it's the most ro robust option. Uh, it's scalable, self-sustainable, uh, fewer complex and critical fault scenarios as it is somewhere else uh, doing its job uh, irregularly. Then we have the soft real-time systems. Um, those are more critical compared to the offline uh, uh, scenarios and further connected to ongoing processes. So they're like acting from the sideline. So with more time available for performing its tasks. And then you can think about the search indexer, for example. So if the update process for that search index fails, then the previous index is still there and the results will be up to date at the next uh, interval. So you can think about a soft real-time uh, uh, system uh, like that. And then we have the hard real-time uh, distributed systems, and those are the hardest to manage. Um, you can think about the request reply systems, transactional systems. Uh, speed is always important um, because of waiting customers or running processes. And I think this is also the one we see most often when uh, developing our apps. So let's uh, suggest a scenario just to make stuff a bit more visual. Um, so we are using uh, Mendex as, a, as an order management system. And at a certain moment in time, uh, an employee tries to update the status of an order, nothing special. Uh, but out of nothing, uh, the system becomes very slow. So and it stops responding eventually. Uh, because on that exact same moment, a scheduled event uh, has caused the application to run out of memory. So the application logs are showing that the app will be rebooted, everything is broken. And although the employee did not cause the issue, uh, both processes share the same tables, the same system, etc. So thereby they share faith. And you immediately know that things are going wrong and you need to re-add or at least check that order uh, if it's there. And this single application setup rapidly becomes uh, more complex when uh, the out of memory issue, for example, uh, was caused by an external request. So think about an external website or web portal, uh, which is sending new orders um, to that same application. And now because there is a bug in that website, uh, the updates are overwhelming the order management system. So the website will still be available, but random things will start to fill. And the employee might report the issue and your monitoring solution will report an alert, uh, but how to cope with the processes in their consumer phase web application. The consumer application should be able to handle like a number of scenarios. And for example, um, has the create order request been delivered successfully? That's something you can think about. And if so, uh, did the order management system process that request? Uh, and maybe the order has been processed but uh, delivering the response to the consumer app field. Uh, and what if everything went right so far, uh, but the consumer app is unable to update that status when receiving the response. So as you can see, it can be hard to handle all these scenarios in, in both systems. And altogether, you can see that the complexity increases at a high pace. So you will need to handle all that potential errors one by one and uh, testing 
this kind of architecture will be just as hard. So even within the consumer application itself, uh, you might come up with a large number of test scenarios already. So when testing this in a distributed setup, uh, the number of cases will grow exponentially, uh, especially because of the variety in network and processing issues that might occur. Uh, and what will you do when an unknown error occurs? Um, has the order been processed by the management system uh, or the management system at all? And there are a few other things which make this quite hard, and that's uh, bugs. So especially when you're talking about distributed bugs, they can be hidden for years, um, but they can have a large impact on your production environment. So most often a very specific combination, so you can see that like the perfect storm uh, could trigger a number of failures uh, in an environment where it's hard to pinpoint the exact cause of, uh, of those issues. So um, I think we have uh, a few options to choose from when, uh, when thinking about handling this kind of failure. Um, and there are four categories for now. Um, and in this session, we will see why one of them isn't the preferred option. And hopefully that, uh, that will be the takeaway of today. Um, so in, four, in short, there are four categories. There are retry, uh, parallel attempts, fill over, fallback, um, and where the first three of them can make your application more robust, uh, the last one uh, can cause more issues than it's trying to solve. So let's uh, review them all. Uh, first of all, first of all, there's retry. Um, this will be my personal favorite, especially when uh, implemented correctly. Uh, there is an awesome web flight uh, module available in the uh, Manix marketplace. It's the Q module. Uh, and possibly starting from Manix 9, you can replace that by using the task queue. Uh, but that will be in the future as it's not uh, supporting retry at the moment, uh, as I uh, as I seen before. Uh, then the next one will be the parallel attempts. I think this one you don't see that often in Manix applications, at least not for me. Um, and it's also requiring a different kind of design where at least once delivery is uh, is accepted. Um, so therefore it's not often used, but you just send the same request a few times and you expect that one of them will be processed properly uh, in short. Uh, then we have fill over. That's uh, exactly the same message. Uh, you send that to another endpoint. Um, so it's, you're expecting the same behavior, uh, but for example, China is down, so you will send it to uh, Europe. Uh, or vice versa, uh, that could be your fillover. Uh, and then there is a uh, fallback. And when talking about fallback, you do something else compared to what you or originally wanted, uh, but you are trying to reach the same goal. So that's, uh, that's the last one. And now we will jump into a scenario again, um, because visual stuff works better. Um, so you will, uh, you build a solution which, uh, uh, in which you need to send a file document uh, from system A to system B. So you are the developer of system A uh, and deliver the solution in which you are using the web service of system B to send those file documents uh, whenever the processes requires it. So not sure about the process which is requiring this, but you get the point. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, system B is not always available. Uh, and in addition to that, system B is not able to cope with uh, larger files at an irregular interval. Um, so as the business reported that critical documents are now missing, uh, you implemented a fallback scenario. Uh, whenever system B throws an error of any kind, you send the documents via mail uh, to the relevant business unit. And now they can use the documents directly and upload them to system B themselves. So, in reality, this will look something like this. So very schematical, but then you see some index to that. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, so this might seem innocent. And, and yes, I have seen comparable solutions like this uh, in existing applications. Um, the rare case uh, will be handled by the employee uh, as soon as he or she opens uh, the email client and the one or two day delay has somewhat to be accepted by the business or even asked for by the business because they said this was a good idea. So 
although this might feel as a decent solution, uh, which will be accepted or even asked for by the, by the business, uh, there are several reasons to not go with this option. Um, and in addition to the possible compliance objections, so who can access that mailbox? Are there valuable documents going back and forth to people who are not allowed to see that? Um, there are also a number of technical considerations. So potentially this fallback isn't, isn't worth it. Um, so you're trying to reach the same goal, um, but with a trade-off. And is this trade-off worth it? So um, with this scenario in mind, you're introducing an alternative process. We saw that, like the employees uploading the documents uh, themselves. Um, and uh, so this is a manual action. So imagine that the company now will grow over time. Uh, and over the years, a major outage of system B um, is, is causing the business unit have flooded mailboxes with uh, too many manual steps to go with the extra work because they didn't think that through that that would happen in like three years or four years. So this situation tells us that most often it's not worth the risk implementing a fill over like a, like a um, fallback like this. So the impact of the fallback scenario um, so the potential need to upload hundreds of documents uh, can be larger compared to the initial failure. And then uh, a fallback scenario is likely to be triggered rarely or not at all. So because of this, the uh, impact of your fallback logic is often underestimated. That's just a developer thing. They think this might happen, click, 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 and there it is. Um, that, that could be something that's happening to you uh, as well. Um, so think about that mail scenario again. Um, because of the implemented solution, you might expect that the document will always be there because you have something, yeah, you have built something, so you expect the document always uh, be there. But what, what if your fallback mechanism is also failing? So the mail server could be unavailable, um, or uh, what if the fallback is so rare that in a few years that mailbox doesn't even exist anymore where you were supposed to send that uh, document to? So uh, the fallback mechanism itself can create an unpredictable load on your systems. Um, and again, then it's, it's causing more pain than uh, initially. Now we have testing. So uh, testing a fallback scenario is also quite hard uh, because you need to force your entire system into a state where that fallback mechanism will be triggered. Uh, and that can be hard. Um, so because it's less likely to be triggered, uh, it might be considered as a harmless piece of logic in your application. And the nature of such solutions increases the likelihood for hidden bugs that might be hidden for years and years. So um, when multiple fallback scenarios in a distributed fashion, so you have quite a lot of systems, then it's even harder to create a perfect storm your, on your own uh, and to, to see if you have pressure points in your uh, in your landscape. So I found this uh, quote uh, when reading through AWS blogs. Uh, I think they are also very helpful for uh, for us as as Mendix developers or just as consultants in general. Um, there are very interesting things about architecture there as well. And um, don't be sad. Uh, we will quickly go through uh, some ideas on how to handle this uh, this bet. So after hearing about those potential pitfalls, uh, you might be looking for those, uh, those potential alternatives. Um, so many presentations alone can be spent on this, uh, but hopefully this, uh, this section will give you a head start. So first of all, you can uh, design and build more resilient and durable non-fallback scenario. So you can decide on using only uh, services with a high availability. Uh, that could be one of the things. Um, then make the source application responsible for uh, handling the error and keep things manageable and as expected. Then again, my personal favorite, so the retry uh, mechanism, uh, if possible. Uh, most often, very small things go wrong uh, when interacting between systems, so just a small networking hiccup or a small this. Uh, and the retry mechanism with an exponential uh, backoff can make your architecture more resilient. You can also create a failover instead of the fallback. 
um, then of course you need to make sure that the output of that failover process is just as re reliable uh, and the output is exactly the same. Um, and you need to test that failover. So by using both options in your production environment on a regular basis, so you don't have uh, surprises in a few years. And then the last one is proactively push data um, because uh, pushing your data to other listening parties as soon as it's available makes that it's available as soon as it's required. Um, and thereby you uh, become less dependent on those other systems to be available because the data is already uh, there. Uh, of course, you can combine this with decent retry logic. Um, and decoupling your applications and choosing for an event-driven architecture um, will solve some of these, uh, these challenges by design. So hopefully you can keep this in mind while watching uh, the rest of the session, because I think uh, some of these things will come up uh, later as well. So conclude. Focus on the logical paths in your logic uh, that occur regularly instead of uh, rarely. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's an uh, important thing to start with. Strive to uh, make your main systems more robust uh, and more uh, predictable. Use push instead of pull whenever you can. And if fallback logic is really a necessity, uh, make sure that it's testable uh, and guarantee that the alternative is just as stable and just as reliable as the regular flow. So if there is already one outage prevented by informed architectural design decision, then uh, this session was worth it for me. Um, that was the, the crash course, let's see. Yeah, it was like 15 minutes, maybe 16. <laughs> so I'm happy with that. Uh, I would like to uh, suggest to uh, give the floor immediately to, uh, to John and, uh, and Leonard to uh, go on with the main course of, uh, of tonight. And if there are any questions uh, at the end of the session, uh, we will be happy to answer them. So uh, thanks for now. And uh, John, it's, uh, it's up to you. Thank you. Here, let me share my screen. Could you end your screen share so I could share? There we go. Oops. Okay, so um, again, my name is John I'm with EXP, and I'll be talking a little bit about um, who EXP is. You may have heard our story before, and how we're using uh, microservices, and then I'll segue into uh, the communication piece for microservices that we use for the most part, which is Kafka. And, and Leonard will get into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of that. Um, but first, um, I'll start with who is EXP Realty? If you haven't heard of us before, um, we're a real estate brokerage. We're based here in the US, um, but we operate worldwide. Um, I think we're in something like 14 countries now. Like It seems to grow by the day. Um, we're completely online. We were like that before uh, COVID, uh, which which just means we don't have any traditionally brick and mortar um, offices. Uh, we all work from home, and we have roughly fifty thousand real estate agents. Um, and so, what does that uh, what does that mean really for me? My job being a developer in um, on the technology side. That means that we have to support those 50,000 agents in, in what they do. Um, mainly, uh, that means uh, creating and managing applications that support all areas of the business, which include onboarding agents into the company um, and includes processing those transactions that those agents um, process. So those trans what those transactions are is an agent, a real estate agent, as you might think of them, would either buy or sell a house or help people do that. And that constitutes, and there's a transaction. Um, and with that, there's a lot of money that needs to be paid out, um, some regulatory things, 
Um, so we need to have our systems that support that. Um, and and then there's the so those those two things are really the biggest lift um, uh, that our systems provide. But of course, there's a lot of other things that that we support those agents for. Um, that could be with helping with sales um, or anything around uh, what a, a real estate agent might need. And the biggest thing that that, that we're finding out um, as a enterprise is we we need to operate on large scales and all of the time. Um, and that's becoming more and more critical as we join different countries, right? Um, U.S., you know, of course, uh, it, is a behemoth for our company because we have the majority of our agents. But as we grow and expand into international um, areas, you know that 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 changes things a little bit. In that uh, we're we're not we won't be expecting the same amount of load from the same amount of times anymore. Um, and we should be anticipating load, at, like I said, twenty four seven. Um, so our architecture, when we when it started, and I wasn't here, but I can imagine when it started, um, EXP broke down their monolith, which was enterprise. It did everything, and they broke that into into um, pieces of the business, logical pieces of the business. I mean, uh, transactions separate, an agent database separate. And then, and then we went uh, a little bit more granular. And with microservices, the goal, the idea is to break things up into um, services. I mean, small components, and you can get, you can really get as granular as you want. Um, but there's a lot of benefit to doing that. One is that you're loosely coupling things, um, and I'll get into the. Uh, Benefits, uh, benefits of that in a second. Um, but you break down the business into uh, bite-sized components, or hopefully they're bite-sized. Um, but doing that, as you can imagine, is a uh, quite the undertaking. When I, like I said in the beginning, I first, when I first heard of EXP was mm, like two years ago at Mendix World and in, 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 in which um, EXP's leaders were doing a, um, an igloo talk about how they've taken their monolith and, and created microservices out of it. Well, um, you know, here we are a couple years later and we're still in the process of doing that. It never, uh, microservices, is never, at least for us, has been ever evolving um, and ever changing. And it's always something that we're working to strive towards to um, uh, architect our systems uh, to be in line with. Um, I think overall, I think just in general, at least for me, um, it's easy uh, to um, during a normal development cycle, as you get requests from the business to add new features or whatever, um, it's easy to say, oh, okay, I'll just add this onto this micro microservices. So what we began to see was we broke out enterprise into uh, chunks, right? Into microservices. But those microservices then started to become little monoliths of their own. And so when, when developing um, a microservices architecture and trying to maintain that, um, it takes discipline. And it takes, um, you know, when you receive uh, requests for new features, it takes discipline to, to take a step back and get everyone on the same page and to say, hey, look, is this something that it, we need to add to a current service or does this to be, deserve to be a, a service on its own? Um, and so the benefits of having things that are loosely coupled, uh, there's a lot. And one of those is being, I think, just a um, low curve of understanding. And when you have things that are, that are in small components, it's much easier to diagnose problems with small pieces. It's much easier to understand. So when you have 
when you're onboarding new developers, it doesn't it doesn't take as long for them to get up to speed um, with a microservice if it's small enough, um, as opposed to you know trying to teach them something of a monolith or something that's a lot a lot a lot bigger. Um, also, it it spreads out the well when you decouple things, it spreads out the the risk um, when you have. When you have each service, when you have little like a specific thing, parts of logic that one app is just devoted to, um, then and it can easier scale um, because the app has its own set of allocated resources and it's not um, affected by anything else that might be sharing those resources because it's only for itself. Uh, I think one thing that I've seen a couple times um, is it, an app may get hung up as a result of another part of the app that didn't really that were uh, if it wasn't broken up into microservices and everything was just operating in one application, you're opening yourself up to risk in that okay if one area of the application uh, you know throws an infinite loop okay the all the whole app is dead. Well, take that you know into a, micro, a true microservices architecture when everything is its own application. If one piece dies, you know, you build, you build uh, security around that. You have defensive measures if, if that one piece dies. And also your other components now are not as affected uh, uh, by that an outage um, as it would have been before. And with so when you're thinking about breaking things up into uh, microservices as well, I think it's it's uh, uh, easy to think um, in terms of like you know okay like I said like a piece of logic like okay this uh, this application needs to um, just process and hold transactions. Um, each there's an application that may be sources of truth for certain types of data. Like I just said, there's an application that's a source of truth for a transaction. There's an application that's a source of truth for uh, payment records, um, for agents. Um, but there can be applications that don't, aren't necessarily don't necessarily need to be like that. There's other kind of types of applications. Um, there could be ones that are basically middlemen. Um, there could be applications that basically are just, they don't have, they don't really have a database. They just kind of direct things. They're like brokers. Um, uh, all of those together are, are work, uh, work, um, or are, are, are different types of applications in a, in a microservices architecture. Another thing is with, is traditionally when you break apart, um, your business into microservices. One thing that you will be thinking about is your database. Um, you know, inherently in every Mendix application that you create, you have, of course, you can make your logic and then you can have your database with it. Um, ideally, ideally, you want to separate that database layer. Um, and that's something that at, at EXP, we're still still exploring and always rethinking on how to do. Because you wouldn't want to um, duplicate your database uh, multiple times and maintain that across multiple um, locations, you would want to have it so you, there is either one source of truth for certain data sets and, but that, that's not always, or at least when EXP started um, down this path, not always the most, um, it doesn't always, um, I think, uh, work. Um, and so sometimes we've had to duplicate um, databases because it's more efficient um, to retrieve the data when we need it, as opposed to going to a source of truth. Of course, that's changing. Now we use um, a couple of different, um, methods to access our databases. Um, we've been, uh, we have something like a data warehouse or data lake. We send our data to, it consumes all the data and we're beginning to um, use that to query data when we need it. Uh, but that gets into um, the communication part of these services. 
Um, and that's where Kafka comes in. Uh, of course, there's a lot of different, there's many different um, methods um, for communicating data. But for us, for eXp in large, we have uh, utilized Kafka heavily to pass um, data between our services. And there's some um, uh, good reasons for that. And why that works for us is um, for a couple, a couple things. A lot of our data kind of waterfalls down and, and doesn't necessarily need um, or, or rely on there being a response from the consumer of that data. Where, so um, I think every situation is unique and for anyone else implementing this, you may, uh, may not use Kafka or may, may um, uh, uh, prefer to use APIs, which is fine. We, we also use APIs for um, servicing data as well. Um, but for us, like I said, because the, mo the majority of our data waterfalls down in that you know, an agent may process a transaction, that transaction is processed, but then that data needs to be worked with. Uh, that data then goes down the line. Some, another service deals with that, um, adds upon it or creates it into something else. And then that data then needs to get, be paid. New data sets are made from that. And so it keeps on going down in steps. And what Kafka uh, provides is a way to publish data and for anyone, any one of our services to then consume it. Um, and it does so in a cool way in that, you know, we don't have to necessarily also worry about things like downtime of certain services because um, those Kafka messages that are published on a topic uh, don't just go away, um, they'll stay there. And so, for example, if I'm gonna, if I have downtime on one of my um, services, say it's down for like a day or more, for some odd reason, which never happens with us. Um, and the uh, app is brought back up. Well, great. We, it just picks up where it left off. Um, within the, within the uh, Kafka cluster, the messages are still, still sitting there waiting for us to consume it. Um, that's a benefit. Also, we don't, um, uh, you don't really have um, you know, you don't, you, you don't really have, you know, there's no, um, errors in the API, right? Um, you're just consuming what they produce. Um, so that's how we use, that's how we use Kafka. Um, just to touch on this, uh, on, on our, uh, producer and consumer philosophy, I think what we've adopted for the most part is that uh, our producers will produce uh, as much data as they think is needed, generally more than they think is needed. And it's left up to our, the consumers of that data to consume or ignore what they care about. Um, that's just the way that, that, that we operate that works for us. Um, yeah, so that gets into what I what I've just been talking about since I forgot to click. Um, again, they're loosely coupled. Small applications, they're easier to manage, easier to scale. Um, have they have their own set of allocated resources? Um, small can be managed by small teams, smaller learning curve, um, and that and uh, our data flow goes downstream, and so. I think now I could keep talking for longer, but I'll hand it off to Leonard to really get into the uh, nitty gritty of, of how Kafka operates. Thanks, John. That's a good, great story. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well done. All right. Take it over. See if this works. Should work. Something like this. Yeah, works. See, you don't click. No, nice. so. way too smooth, way too smooth. Oh, okay, okay, great, 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 good stuff. <laughs> okay, so let's get into this Kafka piece. Uh, so first question would be, what exactly is Kafka, right? So 
uh, when you look up the exact definition of what kind of system Apache Kafka is, it will tell you that Apache Kafka is a event streaming service, right? And if you're like me, you'll be like, sounds cool, but you know, what, what is it exactly? What does that mean? So when we look at a regular application, we will have a database, right? As you see in this picture. And this database encourages us to think in objects, right? It likes us to think in, uh, for in XP's example of agents, of uh, properties, real estate, or transactions. But for Kafka, that is slightly different, right? Kafka doesn't like to think in object. Kafka likes to think in events, right? So say we zoom in, we zoom in on this agent, right? Instead of thinking about an agent, Kafka likes to think in the events that an agent can undertake, right? So we can, for example, have a, a new user, a new agent, or we can have an agent edits his own details, or we can even delete an agent, right? And what Kafka does, it stores all these events as a, as a sequence, right? A log of events. And it does this on a, a time basis, right? So the oldest one will be at the beginning and the newest ones will be at the end. And it will name all these events and uh, the collection of all these events, this log is in Kafka language refers to as a topic, which uh, John also already mentioned, right? So uh, yeah, that's, that's where Kafka is distinguishedly different from a normal database, right? So how does Kafka handle all these events? So it all starts with a producer, right? The producer is the piece of software that Kafka uses to send their messages to their Kafka cluster, where they are then stored, right? We can have one, we can have multiple producers. This, these producers can live on the same application or different applications. So these three producers can belong to, for example, three different application or microservices in the case of EXP. So how does it get this stuff over? So when we try to send an event to a Kafka cluster, we do this in the form of a record. And a record is simply a combination of a topic name and uh, the original message that you'd like to send. And this will just be a string value, right? Just an unlimited string where you can put anything you like in. So then we send this to a certain topic that lives on the Kafka cluster and the Kafka cluster will store this as this log of events that we saw on the previous slide. And then when we move over to the receiving end, we will have consumers, right? So these consumers will take the information, take these records from the Kafka clusters and bring it over to our other applications that are interested. So you don't need to consume all the topics. You can only consume uh, the topics that a certain application is interested in. So for example, the record that we just sent with the produce on the top left, that is interesting for cons the third consumer, right? Because that one is uh, subscribed to topic B in this case. So let's, let's get this to a use case to give it a bit more context. So say we have this microservice, right? Just an example. We have a microservice that uh, is responsible for the agent management, right? So this, uh, this microservice will store all the agent details, for example. So there is an event, right? Some agent decided to change this email for whatever reason. What do we do? So we create this record that belongs to a topic named agent edit. Right, and we use the producer to send an information over to our Kafka cluster. And in this in this message, we have this unlimited string that that I mentioned before, and we decided to put a JSON structure in there. Right, we have this object represent as a JSON structure that is then living on the Kafka cluster from that point on. So that's great. Now we got our uh, message on the Kafka cluster. Now we need to get it to our microservices. So say we have this, this nice group of microservices, right? So this is somewhat like EXP could have it. So we have the cluster on one side and we have the microservices on the other. So we have uh, something with uh, real estate, we have something with transactions, we have some stuff with billing, but uh, the real estate uh, microservice is probably not that interested in an agent changing their email address, right? So that one will consume that data. But billing might be because Maybe even somebody gets his paycheck, he wants it to receive that by email instead of in the, in the regular mail, right? So that microservice will then create a consumer for that certain topic, right? So in this case, that was the user edit topic and we'll have a consumer pull the data from the Kafka cluster so he can then consume it and save whatever he needs from it. So how do we use Apache Kafka with Mendix at the EXP, right? So 
Uh, at EXP, the first step when we want to send uh, data over to the Kafka cluster is we create a object called a message uh, in the original Mendix database, right? This, this message is, among other things, a collection of the, the topic name, the value, which is the JSON structure, and the status. And the status, in this case, will be to be sent because when we create this message, it is still living in our database and it hasn't been sent to the actual uh, Kafka cluster, right? So how do we get this over? We have a thread running in the background and that will be our uh, producer, right, that we saw before. So here's a piece of pseudocode to represent how this uh, producer works. So what it does, we, we start this loop on line one where we keep it running forever until we decide to stop it. Then on line three, you see that we, we're trying to retrieve some messages. So what this function is doing, it's looking in the Mendix database for messages that are in the status to be sent, right? And it takes up to a certain batch size of matches each time. So it then, uh, on line six, we see that when we are on line four, sorry, let me go back. Let me do this in order. So when we on line four, we see when there are messages, right? We jump into this if statement. And then on line six, we convert these messages, these Mendix objects to records because uh, Apache Kafka doesn't know our mes message object. So we need to put it in a record object, which is familiar for the, uh, for the Kafka software. So then we call a producer send, which takes the standard Kafka producer, which is already ready for you when you import the module. And then you, you simply say send, right? We take this batch, take these records that we created and just push them to the, uh, to the Kafka cluster. And then as a final step, we need to take the messages that we just received and uh, change the status, this enumeration value to send. So when we look in the application, we will know that this, this group of messages have actually been sent to the Kafka cluster. So uh, yeah, that is how we send messages at EXP. And then on the other side, we will have a consumer, right? This, this, this is very similar. So again, for a consumer, we will also have this thread running in the background. And, they, and it looks similar, as I said. So this thread will also be running for as long as we want it to, right? So we start it up, say, all right, we have, you are the consumer for this user edit topic, right? We start it up and it will start looking on the cluster or ask the cluster every X milliseconds, are there any records that I'm interested in, right? And that's, that's what, what happens on line three. It will say Kafka consumer poll and it will retrieve all these uh, records that belong to a certain topic that it hasn't consumed before. And Kafka will make sure that we always get each uh, record once, not twice, once, but we will receive every single one of them. So then we create the original message objects. This is the Mendix object that we started off with before the send. So we will have something to work with in our uh, Mendix application. And we will process that using a queued action, right? And the process queue. So you break this down, this will look something like this. You start off with this record object in Java, which is a uh, Kafka uh, entity or object, as you say. We, then we convert it to a me message object, which is a simple Mendix entity. And then we create a queued action in Mendix, and this queued action will eventually be picked up by our process queue, right? And that will execute the microflow in the background. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with this uh, this behavior. So, how does this microflow then look like? What does it look like? So this is, I think, very familiar for most of you. So you have this queued action and associated with queued action, you would have your um, object to work with, right? And so in this case, this will be our Kafka message. And uh, the, the second step will be to take this JSON structure that was originally in this record and convert it back to our a new or the same uh, Mendix object. So then we'll have something to go on. Then we can process it. So that will be the sub update object uh, microflow in this case. This is just an example, of course. So that this um, microfocus, for example, be for the user edit, right? So we get the message, we uh, transfer the JSON or parse the JSON to a agent object, and then we process it by updating the email address within the uh, agent entity. 
And as a last step, we will uh, change the lifecycle status of the message object to process because when we, I forgot to mention that earlier, but when we have a new message that we create using the consumer, it will of course not be in the status to send, it will be in the status to be processed. So at the end of this microflow, we'll put it to process. And yeah, that's how we consume messages at EXP. There's, there's a lot more to it, but this is, uh, yeah, somewhat a high level uh, overview of what's going on. So it's not done, right? We still, we're still working on the Kafka module. So and lately we've been working on a, uh, the performance stability. So uh, we create messages, right? For every message that we want to send to Kafka and every message you receive, we will create this an, a new message entity. And when we are, uh, the producer thread that we've seen before, we'll look for messages in the database, right? So when this table gets really large, we saw that the retrieval times of the messages got uh, very large as well which is unfortunate because that will impact the performance. So we measure that with an empty database or just a few messages in there, it will do 350 messages a second. And when these databases go, go super large, like crazy large, we message the performance could drop to about seven messages per second, which was uh, not what we wanted at all, of course. So we did some database optimizations uh, similar to what Mendix did for their task queue. Um, which was, we will have a object storing all the messages that still need to be worked on, right? And then we have an object that collects all these uh, objects that have been processed. So we have two piles, one needs to be done, one already done. So we're only querying the stuff that still needs to be done, right? Which will generally be a small pile because we can, we should be able to keep up with the work that is given to our producers and to consumers. And we've even worked on a version without any database interaction. So we won't be storing any messages on the database and we will be handing everything in memory and just passing it to Kafka directly. And we've measured performance of a thousand times faster in cir similar circumstances. So we were about, you know, at the bottom we were at seven messages. So this is now without any database interaction, we can go to 7,000, which is uh, realistic when you look at you know, Kafka numbers. Kafka is a very fast platform when used correctly. And there's a lot more we can tweak. So we, we are still discovering all the possibilities of Kafka and uh, how we can get the most out of this. So yeah, I think that was my part. I think that we are still on time for some questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, because I think uh, that the Presentations combined give a very good idea on the architectural as a as a whole um, and the individual components in uh, per Mendix application. Uh, there are indeed a few questions, so um, a few in the chat and a few in the Q and I will drag them in front of me. Um, so first one is uh, from Dalibor. I see what module was used to connect Kafka with the Mendex app? Um, um, yeah, I, I think uh, a colleague built his own at the beginning, right? I, I, I came in once there was already a, a pretty solid foundation and I've worked from there. But from what I heard is that another colleague, uh, Mitchell, built this basically from the ground up. He, there is some basic module that allows you that you can import for the uh, Kafka module um, delivered by Apache. Correct me if I'm wrong, John, but that's what I've seen in the App Store. There is a there is a standard module, and that sh should get you started, right? And we just added up upon that to, for our own special implementation of Kafka. Very well. I, th I think there is another question uh, in line with this one, but we will come to that uh, later. Uh, it's about the implementation in the module itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but thanks for, for this one. I do have one from Stefan in the chat. Um, how do you deal with new consumers, so new applications? Uh, does the new consumer receive all events from Kafka for the relevant topics, or do you have an alternative for such initial loads? So new applications is the question about. 
Um, yeah, so you mean like there is already a lot of data on the Kafka cluster and you, you create a new consumer on a blank uh, application. That's what I understand from that, right? So you have this cluster that already been there for ages and then you start a new consumer. So what you can do is you can say, I only want new data. I only want data that has been a week old. You can present all the data, right, from the original application because that still has all the re um, most relevant data in its own database. So that's what John was talking about with the uh, every app having its own truth, right? And then one application is the ground truth for a certain piece of data. So that, ca that can resend it. So yeah, there, there are multiple ways to run, but there is also a Kafka Connect that we recently found, and that's able to uh, quickly move all data from one uh, from the cluster to your application. Very well. Um, the next question is uh, is one from uh, from Joost. Uh, it's uh, it's about the user experience uh, of such a microservice uh, architecture. So I think uh, John, that would be a question for you. Um, sure. So maybe you can see it already in the Q and A. But he's asking: uh, suppose an agent or other user uh, require data from multiple microservices, and how does EXP approach such use cases? Um, and then he's talking about a, like a gateway app, uh, which you can use as a user interface on top of all the other microservices uh, or multiple browser windows. Um, maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, we still experiment with this. Ideally, for user interaction on your app, um, if they're just requesting data, um, what I think where we're trending in, re in regards to our agents are serviced is we have that data pool um, layer as we call it the data warehouse or data lake um, and so when the user needs info um, then they hit the that API and they get that um, so generally when when we're going through just changing of data uh, as a part of a normal data flow um, it goes, it'll, we'll, we'll utilize Kafka, but then when the users need to see data, just view it, read it, we, we'll utilize the, the, um, that data warehouse and they just hit the API and then get the, get the numbers. If they need to, I mean, we have some instances where those users need to interact with the data, they need to change, it would, it would kick something off, it would change it, set some new data. Um, I, and I think we've experimented with that with iframes and such. Sure. Well, I think it's it's also very interesting to know how different companies are are coping with that uh, issue, and I think uh, a data warehouse is, is especially one of them. So, if I'm understanding you correct, correctly, you're isolating like the process for a certain user group, and they're using that application, which is using data from several applications because they go through that data layer, uh, and thereby right. you don't need different applications or UIs or etc. Yeah, yeah, and we use that data warehouse like for reporting purposes as well, um, because it can take that load. It's meant to take that load of serving up large data sets, um, and because you know we don't want to bog down our services with holding any data as much as possible, and we don't want people querying them either. Um, that's that's how we've been. We, yeah, that's how we're trending towards. Understandable. Very well. Then we do have another uh, question from Xi Wen in the. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, but it's in the in the chat. Um, it's about uh, crashes. So, what if the producer itself uh, crashes between uh, in between when uh, sending messages to Kafka and updating the Manix database? So, like the the thing you don't want. Um, the messages uh, will be sent twice. Is, is that a problem for Kafka or the consumers? Should I take this one, John, or do you want to? Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, I was just going to say it restarts. But you... Yeah, yeah, so uh, in within Kafka, there is a default retry mechanism, right? So Kafka will retry up to, I don't know, 65,000 times when a message gets stuck in this uh, in this loop, right? So you send it out, and as soon as Kafka connected to that message. So it is not necessarily already in the cluster, but it's on its way there. Then it will retry up to, you know, how many times you would like basically. 
And say, say it fails in the uh, scenario of EXP, we always have this uh, local message, right? We have this message in the database that we create before we start sending it. So say it fails, right? We, the, then Kafka will you know, locally send back a failed message, like it, it didn't work for some reason, whatever. And then we'll, we'll get this back in Mendix, right? And then we'll simply set this message to fail to send the status. And we have a uh, event that runs every X minutes to retry those messages that are in, that are in this state. So that will make sure that every message uh, ends up on the cluster. And regarding your comment that a message can be there twice, Kafka is very strict on this, right? Kafka will only save one message per whatever needs to be there. It will always have one record, always. It makes very sure of that. You don't have to do anything. It's just standard Kafka stuff. Those are the good things about using good stuff. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it works really nicely. Oh, very well. I, I do see that it's already uh, 8 o'clock, uh, at least at uh, Central European summertime. Um, so that will be the, uh, uh, the end of this, uh, this meetup for now. There are a few other good questions uh, waiting to be answered in the Q&A. Uh, two were from Joost, who already left us for the, for the production uh, deployment, uh, which was waiting for him. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's a good moment to um, thank you all for, for joining. And especially John and Leonard, thank you for sharing your insights in the EXP landscape and the implementations uh, around uh, Apache Kafka. Um, I think, uh, especially I spoke with Leonard before, but it's, it's, it does stay something that's several companies or several clients or several Mendex practices are looking for implementing microservices in their own uh, landscape. But uh, like thinking about it and doing it are two completely different things. So I think it's very interesting to, uh, to learn from you uh, there. Um, sure. So then again, I think uh, Leonard, you can uh, skip to the last slide. So uh, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> we can have a nappy time. <laughs> Look at that. Very well. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, hopefully you, uh, you enjoyed your, uh, your evening um, and we will have a chance to, uh, to gather you all uh, in, the, in the physical manner uh, sooner better sooner than later um so for now uh, have a good evening have a good uh, afternoon have a good day and uh speak soon right bye 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 everyone bye bye